<laughs> he took all these Olympic Greek gods, stuffed them in human skins, and fed them waffles. <laughs> That's a f***ing weird book, man. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Happy Halloween. Get that coffee. Today I'm drinking a light roast from Heirloom Coffee Roasters out of Oakland, California. The Pacquiao Honey Lot Honey Process from La Paz, Honduras. The notes are juicy plum, honey, and orange blossom. What am I getting out of this? I like it. It's kind of like on the fruitier side. Chocolate covered raisins is what I'm getting. It was a little smoky at the start, but now it's kind of going to fruit. It has a little bit of a black tea thing going on there as well. Not sponsored by them, just figured I'd start telling you guys what I'm drinking. In case something sounds good and you can find it at a store nearby. It'd be cool to drink the same coffee. I think it has a good amount of acid. It tastes kind of, I think what they would call it is bright. And I love that. Maybe fig or some berries. I thought I'd start off the book reviews with coffee reviews in case you come across some of these. Nice packaging too, eh? Yeah, heirloom coffee. That's, that's appropriate for this review. Today, oh God, today. <laughs> Today is Malpertuis, a Belgian Gothic horror novel by the Flemish author Jean Ray, published in 1943. This is another wonderful book from Wakefield Press. I'm sponsored by them in that they sent me this book for free, and thank you very much to them. But in general, I love all their editions. They're typically very quality. They're all marvelously designed. I love the cover on this one. It's this nice glossy Gothic photograph with these ghosts turning into smoke or mist. They're using a great printer. Translated by Ian White. All right, plot-wise, this is the most complex gothic novel I have ever read or come across in my whole life. Takes a cake, easily. It is a labyrinth, a maze. Jean Ray is just one of the pseudonyms of one of the strangest literary figures I've ever come across. Certainly one of the most entertaining to read about. Let me see if I get this pronunciation correct. Raimundus Johannes de Kramer. Forgive me, though, I don't speak Dutch. Other pseudonyms of his include John Flanders, Alex R. Bantam, and Sailor John as he was, in fact, at one point, I believe, an actual sailor, and I believe something of a, possibly a pirate. Just listen to this introduction. The man. Many authors have a myth or legend attached to them, which they more or less assiduously cultivate. Some have more of a myth than others, and Jean Ray was one such. Almost at random, one might cite references to a Dakota Indian grandmother, a youth in early manhood serving on tramp steamers in the South Seas, the China Sea, the Gulf of Carpentaria, in the contraband trade, dealing in whatever came to hand, be it illegal mother of pearl or other more unusual goods, hints of the odd bit of piracy, the reputation for being able to tame tarantulas, and for being no stranger to the lion tamer's cage, involvement in rum row, the offshore trade in liquor during the U.S. Prohibition era, and bearing the scars of gunshot wounds received then. He's a bullshitter, basically. <laughs> he was kind of a crook, a shady guy. Did a couple years for embezzlement, was sentenced to six, but did two. As Hunter S. Thompson said, many fine novels have been written in prison. It just goes to show, for those of you out there who have done some time, you can in fact change your role for posterity. Though, of course, if you're going to prison, depending on how big you are, the changing your posterior role could mean something else entirely. But, you can go from scallywag to cherished author if you write something decent. At least if you're Jean Genet. Or at least something exceptionally fucking weird, as we're going to talk about today. This is easily the most bizarre haunted house novel, gothic novel, and story I've ever come across. And that includes the deeply strange, surreal, and outrageous Japanese film Haosu. A real classic if you haven't had the pleasure. So one thing is for certain, right? Pseudonyms, crime, the life of a sailor perhaps. Genre is not to be trusted. In this story, it is, it is total chaos. He invents quotes from make-believe authors and texts, kind of like Borges. Creates these fictitious authors. Maybe, maybe it's similar to like uh, Pessoa's heteronyms. He paraphrases real authors or texts incorrectly. He makes up quotes and attributes them to real authors, or paraphrases an idea that was perhaps theirs, maybe. Even in the book, these characters appear to be one thing, but they are entirely another. Jean Ray loved chaos, tricks, and mystery. And uh, possibly like gambling and shell games as well, is kind of the vibe I'm getting from him. Among many other things, it seems, he was actually a detective novelist. And for better or worse, unfortunately the latter in my opinion, this entire book has the vague structure of such. We begin with the events surrounding a young man living in an enormous house, uh, probably in Belgium, maybe Ghent, called Malpertuis, which houses the family of this dying patriarch named Uncle Cassave, played in the film adaptation by none other than Orson Welles. The protagonist is a young fellow named Jean-Jacques Grandsire, or maybe Jean-Jacques Grandsire, or Gigi. Nearly all the other members of this family appear to be textbook displays of the various forms of tragic mental pathology. 
Cousin Filarette is a taxidermist. There are three dark spinster sisters, a pair of servants, Jean-Jacques' sister Nancy, as well as a philandering civil servant named Uncle Didelou. There's another fellow who is wandering around the house named Lampernice, who previously worked in the paint shop attached to the house, and now he is a house hermit, dwelling in almost total darkness, fearfully crying out about this uh, shadow, shadowy figure that lurks around the house, following him, putting out lamps, snuffing out all the lamps. He seems to have gone a little funny in the head. Might have been the fumes from the paint shop or something, but anybody's guess. You will never guess, of course, what it actually is. And there does indeed happen to be something uh, following him. Uriel is the foster daughter of Uncle Didalou and his wife Sylvie, and the love interest of Jean-Jacques. She is kind of dark and mysterious and particularly important, as we will see later. She's kind of cold, stony. There are other characters as well, uh, many. There's Dusadam the Younger, who is a priest, as was his father, uh, Dusadam the Elder. They both have important roles in the narrative. Is your head spinning yet? I mean, mine is. It is an absolute narrative circus. I mean, it is more characters in here, it seems, than Gravity's Rainbow. Anyways, Uncle Kasave is dying. His family is living in this house. His dying stipulation to his heirs, to his family, as they have gathered around his deathbed, is that they live together in Malpertuis, all of them, in this vast, crumbling mansion. Those who remain in the house will receive an income, a good one from the sounds of it, but the sole survivor will receive the entirety of the inheritance, which is not named, but vast. So that was the most interesting part of the book for me, like the, the basic premise. Whoever lives the longest out of all of you is going to receive all of this. I thought that was a great premise for a gothic novel, because you could just imagine what would happen with all these characters who seem so sinister, as does Uncle Cassave. So, of course, one by one, as you could have guessed, people start dying in mysterious ways. The most demented moment in the book for me, which is really saying something, was when a fellow who was a shop assistant in the paint shop named Matthias Crook is found, uh, well, initially he looks like he, he's been hanged, but uh, he is not... He has not been hanged. He has been... He, his head has been nailed to the wall, right? Like, off the ground. Nailed to the wall. Through the head. Yet he's still singing this religious song. It's quite creepy. I thought that was one of the best parts of the book. But after that, I mean, as if that wasn't weird enough, things really start to get hallucinatory. Deeply strange, disoriented, surreal. Gradually, we're clued in as to what's happening, though not in the same part of the story. I think the story is divided into four sections, different narrative voices, too. It's all told in the form of found documents, kind of like Lovecraft, The Call of Cthulhu, that sort of thing, which in this book are found in a monastery. So if you were as confused as I was, and I was deeply, deeply confused at points, uh, I've included this guide for you below. And thank you very much to the kind soul who produced it. That looked like it took quite some time and effort. The Lovecraftian element comes from the theme of, you know, uh, old gods. Old gods reawakened, or kind of. In this book, it's a little different. Poe is also an obvious influence. It sometimes reminded me of the Catalan author Jose Pla's uh, Salt Water, one I reviewed a couple years back. And it's kind of preoccupations with food and the seafaring element. In Malpertuis, there are... Or there are um, culinary descriptions of rich dishes that the family eats. You know, they all gather around the table in the evenings to eat these dishes. It was just a detail I noticed, you know, like uh, Jean Ray seemed to be one to really appreciate fine dining. Um, I imagine, you know, months at sea on a ship will probably do that, as will, you know, being locked up in a jail cell. Pla was a journalist, uh, not sure if he was a sailor himself, but I think he was hanging out a lot around the coast of Brava. I think he knew various nautical characters from around that area, fishermen and what have you. But Jean Ray seemed like the kind of guy Pla might write about, at least if we were to trust Jean Ray, which we, again, you know, absolutely should not. But they have this kind of masculine sensibility of the era, which is very interesting. It, but more than that, it seemed like kind of like a sailor thing, you know, this, I don't know, there's a very particular type of guy, an archetype there or something. If one were to ask me the question, you know, what do you think of when you think of Belgium? I personally think of Jacques Brel, but I think many people would think of waffles. Yeah. And indeed, though it may be a cliche that the Belgians have to endure for the entirety of their lives, the truth is, waffles are eaten in the house of Malpertuis. I forgot that it was in Belgium, and I just remember thinking, huh, weird. They're all eating waffles. I love waffles. I started talking about Belgium, and my wife mentioned waffles. And I was like, oh, oh, fuck. They were eating waffles in the book. There you go. 
And speaking of waffling, boy howdy does this Belgian waffle, in the English sense. This book is a hot Belgian mess. Nothing at all against waffles or Belgians or Belgian waffles or the Flemish. All these things are wonderful. Spoiler warning, but it's really just a formal courtesy, as you can't really spoil this plot because it simply makes no goddamn sense. As we progress in the novel and things get more and more demented, um, the off-kilter atmosphere actually reminded me of the Italian horror novel uh, The 21 Days of Turin by Giorgio de Maria, which I reviewed a while back. It must have been four or five years ago at this point. Fuck me running. God. So yeah, spoiler alert, skip ahead 15 seconds if you'd prefer not, though I really don't think it's going to ruin the book for you, because what I'm about to talk about is so completely bizarre, like, you're just going to be like, what? Like, like and you'll probably want to read the book. You'll, you'll probably definitely want to read the book more, or you will absolutely not be interested whatsoever. So, Malpertuis is a cavernous haunted house, right? Not haunted by dead souls or ghosts, but by the dying gods of ancient Greece placed inside human flesh. Cue the Celtic Frost. I am a dying god. For real though, top 10 lifting songs, like, you know, in the gym, songs that will get you gains in the gym, that one is like top three probably. That is a really great song to squat or deadlift or bench to, for sure. That is a, that is a compound movement classic right there. So what has happened is uh, Uncle Kasave turns out to be a warlock with semi, not immortal, but like serious life extension powers that he, he learned, I believe, from the Rosicrucians. And he, uh, with, uh, with a, uh, the, the uh, Dusadam the Elder, uh, sailed to a Greek island and captured the withered, dying Olympian gods and stole them, right? And brought them back to Belgium and placed them inside the bodies, inside the flesh of these characters who inhabit the house. So... It's quite subtle, as you can see. And one of the sailors who facilitated this theft was an ancestor of Jean-Jacques, who I believe also slept with a goddess, and thus um, Jean-Jacques is actually a demigod. He's, he's not just human, he's half god. He's half human, half god, or something. He's got deified blood. He's somehow part deity. Uh, so, yeah, Lampernice, the, the hermit guy who's uh, gone crazy, kind of, and is uh, concerned about being chased throughout the house by the thing that keeps putting out the lamps. Well, he is uh, actually Prometheus, and is in fact being chased by the eagle, which eventually finds him. And, well, you know the myth. The spinster sisters are actually the, uh, the Furies, and uh, Uriel, the love interest of Jean-Jacques, is actually, unfortunately, <laughs> Medusa, the Gorgon. Uh, and she's able to turn people into stone. Those are just a few examples. There's more. And yeah, the uh, malevolent Uncle Kasave is actually much older than he seems. So yeah, Kasave brought all the gods, with the help of Jean-Jacques' ancestor, and placed them in human form, all inhabiting Malpertui. And now he has left it to fate, or Moira, to uh, unfold as it will. The term Moira, uh, the Greek word for fate or destiny, hope I'm pronouncing that properly, is uh, mentioned in the book. Perhaps Malpertui, the house, is, is also, I thought, you know, at one point, a, a metaphor for fate itself. Let's read a description of the house, shall we? The house is a particularly malevolent character in the book. There's some pretty good writing in here. Its facade is a severe mask in which the beholder vainly seeks any serenity, a face feverishly twisted in rage and anguish that fails to conceal the abominations that lie behind it. Those who lie down to sleep in its vast rooms lay themselves open to nightmares. Those who spend their days there are obliged to habituate themselves to the company of the atrocious shades of executed criminals, of men flayed alive or walled up or otherwise tormented. Yeah, so quite the, uh, quite the place to raise a family. In the guide that I've linked below, I didn't catch this when reading the book, but it, it seems that Casave's whole goal was to create a demigod race via Jean-Jacques and Uriel, Medusa, right? Have them get together and, yeah. Or he just wanted to see what would happen if he stuck a whole bunch of Greek gods and people under the same roof and watch them go. See what happens. Fight to the death for their inheritance or something. I, I have no idea. The motivation 
for these characters in the book is, is really not apparent at all. It's, it's really quite something. Unfortunately, Malpertuis, as incredible as the array of elements that went into forging its narrative is, does not, in my opinion, really work like at all. The sheer confusion of everything doesn't allow for the dread to build as in Lovecraft and the kitchen sink method that Jean Ray employs here of heaping fantastical horror upon more complex plot detail only serves to water down any atmosphere that the book conjured in the first place, which it does sometimes. But I mean, my head was spinning the whole time just trying to hold on to some plot element for dear life. I mean, by the end when Dusadam the Younger is revealed to be a werewolf, I was just like, this is what we call deciding to say, fuck it. I just couldn't find an emotional thread, right? I couldn't find a character to inhabit, ironically. They were so thin, they really did resemble the inflated skins of all the hollowed out people. Starts to get rather expository by the end. Again, that mystery thing. It's kind of like Scooby-Doo. <laughs> he took all these Olympic Greek gods, stuffed them in human skins, and fed them waffles. <laughs> That's a fucking weird book, man. By the end of it, though, for me, while there was a little curiosity to figure out how things wrap up, so to speak, or don't, there was also a seriously exhausted feeling of, you know, get on with it. The strokes are too broad and the scale is too epic. Basically, it's like trying to stuff an Olympian god inside a human body. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. At its best, it feels like an ethereal horror story and a meditation on the only thing more powerful than the gods, fate. And the book's depiction of Ray's fascination with the idea of ancient dying gods is interesting, for sure. At its worst, it reads like a bad mystery or horror or fantasy screenplay. The book oscillates wildly between these two extremes in a disorienting, clunky mess. And I can't shake the feeling that it was overcomplicated simply because he was more concerned with making it look complex rather than attempting to construct a truly horrifying story of substance a la Lovecraft or Poe. He gives me the impression of a guy who may have been one to try and cut corners, if you get my drift. Yeah. It felt very surface by the end. It felt vastly underdeveloped. Needed years more. You may have to really love detective mysteries to appreciate this one. And I love Georges Simenon. You know, I, I, I love Patricia Highsmith. Um, but this is just, no, uh, nah, mm-mm. So better than food? No, nah, not for me. Not this time around, at least. But truly one of a kind, and impossible to properly describe. It's something you have to experience for yourself. I will give it that. In terms of sheer audacious creativity, though, you have to hand it to Jean Ray for the attempt of pulling it off. Even though I don't think he does, by a long shot. But even if there are elements in here derivative of other horror authors, on the whole, it really is its own masterpiece of the weird. Even if it doesn't work. I mean, it is singular, right? It is unique in that it is so goddamn weird. So yeah, if you read it, I've included a guide to the novel below with all the characters in a summary. I suggest you do it like I did though. Go read the book first by itself and then afterwards, if you're still confused, and I'd bet money you will be, then take a look at the guide. It'd be a good Halloween read. However, in the book, it takes place partially over uh, Christmas and Candlemas. So you still would have synchronicity with the upcoming dark seasons if you want to pick it up for the winter. And if it sounds at all interesting to you, I highly suggest you do. Yeah, so you should read it. I think any fans of the Gothic novel, if you're a fan of Lovecraft, of Poe, and yeah, if you like Pinchon or Borges and all that sounds interesting to you, then you might want to try it out. See if it works for you. It didn't work for me, but that's okay. All right. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, welcome. Thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take the names of all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show, I place your names in this mason jar, and for every review, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. Currently, it's from Nicaragua. It's one of my favorites I've ever roasted. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, you can click on the link below in the description, or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, and donate $5 or more per video, and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. You'll also get access to all the cool stuff listed below under the $1 tier. However, the $1 tier is being phased out, and will end at the end of the year. So on January 1st, 2024, it will be gone. So if you're going to support the show, I would highly suggest any of the other tiers. Thank you so much. And international shipping is included. Thank you very much to all the patrons, and best of luck. All right, here we go. George. George L. Thank you very much, George. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive Jean Ray's Malpertuis. Plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. And I hope you love both. Cheers. 
Please subscribe if you have not already and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this and always remember, die reading. All right. Thanks very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Happy Halloween. Talk to you soon. Ciao.